A group of friends are driving down the highway late at night. They're on their way home from a concert, and after the long night of dancing and partying, all of them are feeling quite tired. The radio is turned off, and after so much loud music, the silence is refreshing. No one is talking at all, and in fact, the driver notices that both his girlfriend sitting next to him, as well as his friend in the back seat, have fallen asleep. The driver tries to make sure that he doesn't do the same as the car moves down the long stretch of straight, empty highway. The driver's eyes start to grow heavy, though. He can feel the weight of sleep starting to press on him. He turns the radio on at a low volume, but that only staves off the drowsiness for a moment. He can't fight the approach of sleep any longer, and his eyes start to close. As he drifts off to sleep, his foot presses down slightly more on the accelerator. The driver's head slumps to the side as the car gains speed and begins to pull to the right of where it crosses the white line marking the edge of the highway. The tires dip off the road into the dirt, and the sudden change causes the driver to jerk back awake. He quickly swerves the car back onto the road. The sudden jolt causes both the passengers to wake up. Is everything okay? The driver tells them that he just swerved to to avoid an animal in the road. That's right, nothing to be worried about. They can go back to sleep. As both of his friends close their eyes and try to go back to sleep, the driver spots something. Lights have appeared in his rearview mirror. It's a pair of headlights. He didn't notice a car pulling out or speeding up behind him, but he must have missed it when he was dozing off. His heart is still racing from when he drifted off the road, and he's trying to regain his composure, but it's about to get a whole lot harder, because when he looks in the mirror again, he sees that the telltale red and blue lights of a police cruiser have lit up behind him. Oh crap, oh no, oh no, the driver says out loud. Everyone is awake now and aware of the cop behind them. They grow nervous and start freaking out. Not all the activities they had partaken in at the concert were, strictly speaking, technically legal in this state. What do we do? The driver asks. You've got to pull over, says his girlfriend. The cop car's sirens come on. This is serious. But then something strange happens. They hear a voice in the car, coming over the radio. It's too quiet to hear, but when the driver turns up the volume, the message comes through loud and clear. It's a gruff voice that keeps repeating the same phrase over and over. You better run. How is this message coming over the radio? They don't know, but the passenger in the back seat agrees with the voice. They've got to try and run. They have to get out of here. The driver's girlfriend is screaming to pull over. The cop car speeds up and is right behind them now, almost on their bumper. It's lights flashing and sirens blaring. The driver doesn't know what to do. Should he pull over? Should he try to run? Everyone is yelling. He starts to push down on the accelerator, but then thinks better of it. There's no way this old car can outrun a cop. Finally, he makes the decision to break and starts to pull the car to the side of the road. The police car comes to a stop behind them. The sirens are off, but the bright lights are almost blinding. They sit in the car and await their fate. But nothing happens. The car is just sitting there behind them. After what feels like a long while, the door of the cop car finally opens. The three passengers watch silently as a highway patrol officer steps out and begins approaching their car. The driver tells everyone to relax, that this is going to be just fine, but the passenger in the back starts to panic. He can't get arrested. If he does, it will mean that he loses his scholarship. He'll get kicked out of school. His whole life will be over. The highway patrol officer reaches the car. Despite it being late at night, he's wearing dark aviator sunglasses that cover half of his face. He stands in front of the door to the car and waits. The driver, feeling nervous and afraid, rolls down his window. The police officer doesn't move or react, though. He just keeps standing next to the car. Um, good evening, officer, the driver says. No response. The driver turns and looks at his girlfriend in the front seat, but all she can do is shrug. He turns back to the highway patrolman. Did we do something wrong? There's another long pause, but then the patrolman finally reacts. He bends over and leans in close, sticking his head practically through the open window and putting his tight-lipped face right next to the driver's. Do you... do you want my license and registration? The driver asks. The patrolman doesn't respond. He reaches up and slowly grabs the side of his dark aviator sunglasses. He pulls them down, and the driver finds himself staring into a pair of bright, red, glowing eyes. Evil eyes. Everyone in the car starts to scream as the thing standing in front of them opens its own mouth to reveal a big, black, gaping hole with no gums or teeth 
a horrifying void in its face that screams right back at them. As you may have already deduced, this was no normal traffic stop, and certainly not a normal highway patrol officer. No, the entity that this group of young adults encountered that evening was one that dozens before them had the same misfortune of running into, and one that the SCP Foundation is actively trying to stop from engaging in its frightening and dangerous behavior. This is SCP-973. SCP-973 is not one, but actually two separate entities. The first, designated SCP-973-1, is a police cruiser that appears to be a model similar to those used by actual state troopers during the early 1970s, and its condition is much like you would expect for a well-used, nearly 50-year-old vehicle, with much of it being in an advanced state of disrepair. Eyewitness accounts of SCP-973-1 have described the police car as having numerous dents on the doors and hood cracks in the windshield, multiple rust spots, and a rear bumper that looks to be held on with duct tape. The vehicle's driver and sole occupant has been designated SCP-973-2. This humanoid figure has an appearance that resembles a Caucasian male in his late 40s. It is dressed in the state trooper uniform that, like 973-1, also looks to have come from the early 1970s. And eyewitnesses have described him as being slightly overweight, balding, and sporting a handlebar mustache. Both the anomalous car and its driver will appear at night in a specific location along a particular U.S. highway. It is unknown exactly what will cause SCP-973 to show up on this road, but Foundation researchers have hypothesized that its manifestation may be triggered when a vehicle accelerates over a certain speed. You may think you're safe, then, if you stay below a certain speed, but unfortunately, you'd be wrong. It's unknown exactly what speed limit infraction will lead to SCP-973's appearance, with reports ranging from 35 miles per hour all the way to 70, but when it does occur, the driver will find that they are now a target. SCP-973 will materialize roughly half a kilometer behind the targeted vehicle, and will approach them at a high rate of speed. SCP-973-1 sirens will turn on, and its lights will flash as it also somehow broadcasts a message into the targeted car that is picked up on the car's radio, a message that urges the driver to run, often accompanied by several expletives. In most cases, the targeted vehicle will abide by the instructions over the radio and begin to flee, though it's unlikely that this is due to any mimetic effect. Rather, it would seem that most run out of pure terror. SCP-973 will then pursue the targeted car, leading to a high-speed chase. No matter how fast the targeted car is, though, the SCP-973-1 police cruiser will always be faster. And it typically takes no more than six minutes for them to be overtaken. SCP-973 seems to have no qualms about ramming into the fleeing car, which likely accounts for the extreme damage present on the patrol car. While it is unclear exactly what happens once 973 forces the targeted vehicle to stop, either through their own choice or by being rammed off the road, the results are quite disturbing. The vehicle that fled will later be located somewhere near SCP-973's spawning location, usually within roughly 6 kilometers of the road. Whether the vehicles that are found that far from the road drove there in a panic or were somehow transported there by anomalous means isn't clear. What is clear is that the occupants of the cars met a truly grisly fate. Their bodies will show signs of extreme violence and assault, including evisceration and some have been so badly named and mangled that visual identification was impossible. The vehicles themselves are badly damaged, showing signs of impact from another vehicle, and severe burn damage is often present in the interior. So far, over 34 individuals and 19 vehicles have been designated as victims of SCP-973, though it is likely that the true number is much, much higher. Perhaps most terrifying of all is that some of the victims survived. The Foundation has recovered five individuals from sites of SCP-973 attacks, who, in addition to their gruesome physical injuries, also suffer from varying levels of ongoing mental trauma. But why not just destroy the road that SCP-973 appears on, you ask? Well, the Foundation had this same idea, and in 1983, the section of highway affected by SCP-973 was demolished, in an attempt to stop it from manifesting. This attempt failed, though. All this led to was SCP-973 changing its location, where it immediately began engaging in the same deadly behavior. Numerous attempts have also been made to try and capture both 973-1 and-2. In one such event, several teams of SCP Foundation containment specialists were dispatched to its section of highway with the mission to subdue and contain the anomaly. 
After multiple attempts to get SCP-973 to appear by driving down the highway at various speeds, a car carrying several agents was finally successful, and they spotted the flashing red and blue lights of 973-1 behind them as the message telling them to run began playing over the radio. With no further warnings, the anomalous police car closed in on them, even faster than the agents were expecting, and immediately began ramming into their car. A van filled with additional containment specialists was dispatched to the area to help, and when they reached the area that the GPS tracker on the pursued car led them to, they found that they were too late. SCP-973 had pushed the agent's car far off the road and was ruthlessly tearing their bodies apart. The arriving containment team immediately began firing on 973 in an attempt to save their fellow Foundation agents. The team's weapons appeared to cause some injuries to 973-2, showing that it is perhaps vulnerable to lasting damage just like the 973-1 vehicle is. In a post-mission interview, one of the agents described SCP-973's new appearance. His eyes were red, and his mouth, it was just a black hole. No teeth, no tongue, just a hole. No other reports would come from this incident, though, as this agent was the only survivor. SCP-973 killed the other nine agents and fled the scene. While it is believed that the Foundation team was able to wound the anomalous creature, it was neither contained nor incapacitated in any real sense, and the next report of a 973 incident occurred just nine days later. SCP-973's ability to seemingly appear at a new location and the difficulty it has shown in being contained has gotten it a well-earned Euclid classification. The roughly 60 kilometers of highway on which it is known to appear is under satellite surveillance at all times, and all traffic between 10 p.m. and 4.30 a.m. is diverted along a non-highway detour route, by force if necessary. Unfortunately for the SCP Foundation and the general highway-using populace, these security protocols have necessitated frequent updates, because while the area that SCP-973 engages in its predatory behavior on is well known, both the time of day during which it will appear and the area it seems to affect are expanding. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-745, The Headlights, for another anomaly that will make you question whether you should ever drive again at night. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives. A young woman on her way home is walking down a city street, and just like most nights, the downtown empties out after the working day ends, leaving the streets empty of both cars and pedestrians. She hates when she has to close the shop and walk to her bus stop alone, and she is excited that in just another week, she will be starting a new job that's just around the corner from where she lives. She just has to get through these last few nights of being the last one at the store and having to walk home alone. Her more immediate concern now, though, is that her music has stopped. The young woman takes her phone out to check it. Dead. She must have forgotten to plug in the charger. She hates when she does that. Now she'd have to spend the bus ride staring out the window at nothing. What was that? The woman looks up from her phone. Did she see someone? She turns around and sees something on the other side of the street. It's dark, and all she can make out is a big shadowy figure. She doesn't stare for long though, and starts to walk again, picking up her pace slightly. She can hear the sound of footsteps and glances over her shoulder. The person across the street is moving too, and they seem to be matching her pace, avoiding any streetlights to remain in darkness. She starts to move a little quicker, and so do they. The young woman grips the pepper spray in her pocket. She doesn't know what this person is doing or what they want, but she's going to be ready for them. She keeps walking and glances over her shoulder again. They're crossing the street towards her now. She ducks into an alley, and as soon as she's around the corner and out of sight, she starts to run. She sprints through the alley as fast as she can. She looks behind her, frightened of what she might see, but no one is there. Maybe she was wrong and they weren't following her, but she's not about to stop running and find out. She emerges from the alley still running as hard as she can. She reaches her bus stop and finally stops to catch her breath. She checks her watch. The bus should be pulling up right now, but it's nowhere to be seen. She looks around, and what she does see is the shadowy figure coming out of the alley, and it's coming straight towards her. She backs up into the bus stop and takes the pepper spray out of her pocket, her finger ready on the trigger. The shadowy figure keeps moving towards her when suddenly the dark street is lit up. The woman looks behind her to see her savior. It's the bus. 
She turns back to see the shadowy figure retreating to the alley, as if the light is pushing it away. The woman breathes a sigh of relief, and finally lets some of the tension in her body release as the bus comes to a stop in front of her. The door swings open, and the woman steps inside. I've never been so happy to get on the bus, she says to the driver as she scans her transit card. The driver doesn't respond, though. In fact, he doesn't react to her at all. He just keeps staring straight ahead. The woman doesn't push it, though. She's just happy to be on the bus, even if it is completely empty. She heads to the back of the bus and takes a seat. As the bus pulls away, she can almost swear she could see the shadowy figure standing in the alley, watching her. The bus rumbles along the empty city streets as the woman looks out the window and takes deep breaths, trying to calm herself after her harrowing ordeal. After a while, she notices that the bus doesn't seem to be stopping as much as it normally does, or at all for that matter. Did they change the route? Or did she get on the wrong bus? They are approaching her stop though, so it doesn't matter, and she reaches up to pull the cord. A bell chimes and the stop requested light illuminates in the front of the bus, but the driver doesn't show any sign of stopping or even slowing down. She pulls the cord again, but still no reaction. As she sees her building go by, she calls out, hey, this is my stop, but the driver doesn't acknowledge her at all. She stands up and walks to the front. Didn't you hear me? This is my stop. Still no reaction from the driver. Hey, I said. She reaches out and grabs his shoulder, spinning him towards her, only to find herself staring into the eyes of a fresh corpse. The woman screams and jumps back as the driver slumps forward towards her. She's terrified by the dead body, as well as the fact that the bus will crash. But when she looks at the steering wheel, she sees that it is continuing to move on its own. The woman is in a full-blown panic now. She screams and pounds on the door, but it won't open. The engine roars as the bus starts to pick up speed. She doesn't know what to do and runs to the back where she tries the rear door, but it doesn't budge either. The bus speeds up even more, whipping around corners and tossing her from side to side. She's thrown to the ground and hits her head. Her eyelids feel like they weigh a hundred pounds, and she struggles to keep them open. She manages to stay awake, though, and as she looks up in a daze, staring at the ceiling of the bus, she can see a green gas emanating from the vents. It's the last thing she sees before her eyes close for good. The bus finally comes to a stop in a deserted area of the city. The vehicle raises slightly as, one after another, each wheel appears to unfold, revealing them to be long, black, spindly legs. The bus stands up on these insectoid appendages as its roof splits into two massive wings. The bus then leaps up into the sky, spreading its wings, and flies off into the night. How could this young woman have known that after escaping danger, that her rescuer would be something worse, much worse? Unfortunately for her, she had just willingly stepped onto an instance of SCP-2086, a deadly and terrifying anomaly that hides in plain sight as it stalks and hunts its human prey. SCP-2086 is the designation the SCP Foundation has given to a species that appears to belong to the arthropod phylum, a group that also includes arachnids and crustaceans. These strange creatures differ from most of their lobster and spider brethren in that they make use of an advanced form of camouflage to move among modern society unseen. Adult SCP-2086 instances all resemble some sort of public transportation vehicle, with the exact make, model, year, and branding varying from instance to instance. SCP-2086 instances move about the streets of our cities foraging for food, and at first glance, they are virtually indistinguishable from the standard transit vehicles they are mimicking. Close examination of them, though, will reveal that the steel, wood, plastic, and glass they are composed of aren't those materials at all, but a form of specialized chitin, which is the substance that makes up the hard exoskeleton of many insects and other arthropods. And that's not the only aspect of SCP-2086 that isn't actually what it appears to be. The wheels on the bus may go round and round, but they also are capable of unraveling into long, thin legs that create a very imposing image when SCP-2086 is standing up at its full height. The roof, too, is able to unfurl into a set of giant insectoid wings, and after leaping into the air with its powerful legs, the wings will spread and the bus can take flight, which appears to be its preferred method of travel when it is not in its camouflaged hunting mode. Its headlights, too, are an entirely biological mechanism, consisting of two large bioluminescent optical organs similar to those possessed by SCP-015-IT and SCP-745. Dissections of SCP-2086 specimens have shown them to have an entire system of organs, including a heart, brain, and stomach, 
which are found beneath the flooring in the creature's interior chamber. SCP-2086 appendages are not just used for locomotion, though, and they have been observed as being able to use them for fine object manipulation. This fact was learned when they were observed building crude shelters from scrap materials at their nesting grounds. More on these nests and the terrifying events that take place there later. When SCP-2086 is not at its nest, it engages in its foraging behavior. Typically, an SCP-2086 instance will fly to the start of a route and begin driving along city streets, picking up human passengers who willingly enter the creature's inner chamber, thinking that it is a standard bus. Along with its exoskeleton closely resembling a real vehicle, SCP-2086 has one more particularly gruesome trick to fool would-be passengers into becoming its prey. A bus that drives itself would lead many to think twice about stepping on board, so SCP-2086 makes use of a decoy driver, which is actually a human corpse encased and preserved in a shellac-like substance. Smaller, fibrous appendages protrude from the front seat and into the corpse, which hold it in place and are even capable of manipulating the corpse, giving it the appearance of movement as it drives the bus. Once SCP-2086 has gathered up what it considers to be enough victims, a number that appears to vary from instance to instance, it will release a noxious gas from its interior vents. The gas produces an effect in humans similar to chloroform, and everyone on board will be rendered unconscious. The creature, now filled with its prey, does not feed on the humans trapped inside it though. Instead, it will take them to its nesting grounds, which is where the real horror begins. These nesting grounds are most often localized in scrap and junkyards that have fallen into disuse or are completely abandoned, and it is in these nests that the juvenile instances of SCP-2086 are found. While a full-grown instance can weigh as much as 17,000 kilograms, which is the approximate curb weight of a normal bus, extensive field research and observation into SCP-2086 has led to the identification of the smaller, juvenile instances, which are much smaller than their adult counterparts, weighing under 200 kilograms. But they don't stay this size for long. When an adult SCP-2086 arrives back at the nest with its interior chamber filled with human prey, it will open its doors and allow the juvenile members to enter inside of it so they can feed and grow. Once inside, a juvenile will remove a passenger from the bus and take them outside. The effects of the chloroform gas will often begin to wear off at this time, but by this point, it is already too late. The juvenile instance will then proceed to force the human into a hole located under their hood. This leads to a sort of digestive tract that connects to its inner chamber where the driver's seat is located. Small, hair-like appendages will then emerge from the seat and protrude into the prey's body, which hold them in place in the driver's seat and trap them there, while at the same time acting as feeding tubes, draining the blood from the now-doomed passenger. Once the person has been completely drained of blood, the feeding tubes will begin secreting a saline solution as the internal compartment fills with a shellac-like substance, and the effects of both combine to effectively embalm and preserve the corpse, which will serve as its own decoy driver once it enters adulthood. And this process happens quite quickly. A newborn SCP-2086 will reach adulthood in just one week, provided that it has had access to nutrients at which point it will begin searching for new sources of prey for its own offspring, of which it will likely have plenty. 2086 instances become capable of reproduction at 8 days, and females are able to produce up to 20 offspring, but their lives are quite short, with their entire life cycle usually lasting just 12 to 15 days. Prior to feeding and beginning the process of becoming a full-size adult, juveniles will also leave the nest and will covertly move about the city, removing bus stop signposts and relocating them, often creating a route that leads back to its own nest. These are the routes that adult instances will then typically follow as they hunt for more prey to bring back to their colony. SCP-2086 instances have been found in metropolitan areas around the world, and news reports are closely monitored by the Foundation for missing persons that had recently used public transport, with Foundation field agents being dispatched to potential high-threat areas to investigate further. Any nests that are discovered have their locations condemned, if they weren't already, and demolished using chemical explosives. Previously, an effort was made to capture and contain live instances of SCP-2086, and currently the Foundation has five such specimens in its custody, which are stored in a converted airplane hangar. Due to their short lifespans and high rate of reproduction, the amount of live specimens contained at any given time can vary widely. 
and will often depend on the number of available D-Class personnel who can serve as drivers. Terminated specimens are either destroyed or sent to a specialized cold storage container at a secure site for further biological research. SCP-2086 continues to be one of the most dangerous anomalies for common, everyday users of public transportation, and the SCP Foundation has classified it as Keter. While identified colonies are able to be destroyed with minimal effort once discovered, there is no telling how many nesting grounds still remain in the wild. So the next time you're about to board a bus, pay extra careful attention to it, or you may find that your bus is rerouting you somewhere you never wanted to go. It's late at night and you're driving down a desolate stretch of highway somewhere in New Mexico. There's nothing out here except for you, your car, and the road. What you don't know is that you're about to encounter something. Something terrifying. There's no moon, and the sky is pitch black. Your own car is barely lighting up the dark road ahead of you. Just then, you spot something in your rearview mirror. It's a pair of headlights. There's nothing too strange about them except that they are especially bright. Your eyes are so adjusted to the darkness that you have to look away. When you glance in the mirror again, you see that they're closer. Much closer. They must be going awfully fast. You don't know why, but something about the car behind you makes you feel uneasy. There's something off. You speed up a little. Maybe you can keep some distance from them. But the lights keep getting closer. So you speed up a little more. Still, they gain on you growing bigger and bigger in your rearview mirror. You're getting nervous. They look like they are barreling right towards you. You floor it. The lights are able to keep up easily, though. And now, they're right on your tail. No matter how fast you go, they stay right behind you. The lights are so bright and close that they're almost blinding. You're in a full-blown panic. What is going on? Now the lights are swerving back and forth behind you. What do they want? You take a sharp turn without indicating, but they follow you without difficulty. You keep your foot smashed down on the accelerator. Your engine is screaming, but they just get closer and closer. They're right on your bumper. The bright white lights burn your eyes so bad that you swat at the rearview mirror to point it down. You look up just in time to see the deer standing in the middle of the road. You slam on your brakes as hard as you can. Your tires squeal loudly in the night and you brace yourself to both hit the deer and get rear-ended from behind. You stop inches from the deer as something incredible happens. The two headlights seem to split, passing by you on either side of your car. You and the deer lock eyes for a split second as if you're both thinking, what was that? Before the deer hops away into the night. You don't know what's happening, but you're not going to wait around to find out. You throw the car in reverse and hit the gas before whipping it around 180 degrees can't remember how far the last town was, but there's no chance you're going in the direction of those lights. You drive as fast as you can, checking your mirror constantly to see if anything is behind you. Nothing. Just darkness. Maybe you're finally safe. No, they're right in front of you. The lights somehow appear out of nowhere right in front of your car. You turn the wheel hard to avoid a head-on collision and you go flying off the road, smashing your head against the window as the car goes flipping and rolling and tumbling. The car comes to a stop a hundred feet off the road, upside down, with a lone blinking turn signal dimly lighting up the surrounding field. A single headlight approaches the car, but it's not moving like a vehicle, it's moving like an animal. You're concussed from the accident, and your vision is starting to fade. The last thing you see is a second light approaching. The next morning, the local sheriff is investigating the scene of a single car accident. Curiously, there's no body just a few scraps of clothing, and a pair of tennis shoes sitting neatly in the upside-down roof of the car. Strangest, though, are the childlike handprints all over the dirty car door. The sheriff doesn't know what to think. What the sheriff doesn't know is that he has just come upon the aftermath of an SCP-745 attack, a strange and mysterious creature known as the Headlights. SCP-745 is the classification the SCP Foundation has given to a bipedal, nocturnal predator whose hunting grounds are an abandoned stretch of highway in northern New Mexico. SCP-745's most distinctive feature, by far, is its head, the top of which is a bloated sack of translucent skin. There are no visible sensory organs present on the head, nor does it appear to have a solid skull, and the creature's brain can be directly seen through the semi-transparent skin 
which is covered in a web of bioluminescent organs. These organs are capable of producing a steady output of light that's been measured between 1400 to 3200 lumens, which is the equivalent of bright xenon gas headlights. The entity has been observed to have the ability to change the color of this light, as well as flash it in specific patterns. It is theorized that it engages in this behavior as a way to defend itself, and potentially may also use it as a way to communicate with other members of its species. The rest of SCP-745's body is covered in skin that is a deep, dark, black color that almost seems to absorb light. This quality, when paired with their blindingly bright head protrusion, gives the appearance of a floating point of light in the darkness. Because SCP-745 entities hunt almost exclusively in pairs, with their preferred hunting grounds being remote sections of highway, they are easily mistaken for oncoming or approaching headlights. Two SCP-745 entities are able to move together in perfect synchronicity, running in tandem at speeds up to 180 kilometers per hour. Together, they will target lone vehicles that they spot on the highway, and will begin to chase or run straight towards them, giving the unlucky driver the impression that a fast-moving car is rapidly approaching them. After they near the targeted car, they will attempt to stop it by any means necessary, whether by simply forcing the driver to pull over out of fear, or by running them off the road completely. Once their prey has stopped, crashed, or become otherwise incapacitated, the pair will stop moving together and approach the car separately to directly assault and then consume the vehicle's occupants. Next to no remains are left following an attack, save for a few scraps of clothing in the victim's shoes. Other than the damage sustained during the accident, there is never any other sign of struggle or forced entry, with the only other evidence left at the scene being the childlike handprints from SCP-745's small front paws. Strangely, analysis of SCP-745's genetic structure has revealed that unlike humans, they are not a carbon-based life form, meaning it is unlikely then that they are able to derive any nutrition from the consuming of human flesh. It is theorized then that they may be hunting solely for sport or some other form of perverse enjoyment. This question remains unanswered as currently there are no recorded observations of SCP-745 feeding in the wild, as successful attacks have never left any witnesses, and specimens captured by the SCP Foundation refuse to eat at all. No layers, nests, or other refuge of SCP-745 has ever been found, nor has the Foundation located any breeding grounds or young examples of the entity. It's unknown how or if they reproduce, or when they may have first appeared. What is known is that they had established a wide hunting territory across the American Southwest until Foundation teams began a program to thin their numbers in the 1960s. The effort appears to have been successful so far, and all recent sightings of SCP-745 have been limited to a specific stretch of highway in northern New Mexico. SCP-745 has been classified as Euclid, and in order to limit potential exposure to civilians, the Foundation has purchased the land surrounding the highway with traffic being redirected to other roads. Foundation security teams disguised as highway patrol officers are to remove any trespassers or lost travelers who accidentally find themselves on the dangerous stretch of highway. The security teams are also tasked with attempting to capture any instances of SCP-745 that they can, and any recovered creatures, live or dead, are to be loaded into Class 3 BCU storage containers and transferred to Site 17 for further study. Containment procedures that are able to preserve living specimens are still being researched, and currently, no examples of SCP-745 have survived for more than a week in captivity. However, seeing as there have been no new sightings of SCP-745 outside of the isolated and monitored stretch of highway, and all reports of phantom lights elsewhere in the country have not pointed to evidence of additional SCP-745 outbreaks, they are considered to be effectively contained. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, and make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives. A 7-year-old girl and her 13-year-old brother are settling in for their favorite after-school activity, watching TV. The children's parents won't be home from work for several hours, and watching the after-school programming together before making a snack is a staple of their day. The boy takes his normal position on the couch as the girl plants herself right in front of the television and turns it on. This is the time when Pretty Pony Paradise comes on and she never misses an episode. Her brother would prefer something else, but he also loves to see his sister happy 
so he always lets her watch the ponies have their adventures. Today, though, when she turns to the right channel, there's something else. Instead of the usual Pretty Pony theme song, circus music comes out of the television speakers. The girl watches as the brightly colored words, Bobble the Clown, appear on the screen. Hey, this isn't Pretty Ponies, she says to her brother. But when she looks back, he's asleep. The girl isn't happy, but she decides to give this new show a chance. And maybe her pony show will come on after anyway. The circus music stops, and a happy-looking clown cartwheels onto the screen. Hello, kids, the garish clown says. Do you like fun? The girl did like fun. Perhaps this new show wouldn't be so bad. She watches as Bobble walks down the street of an average, happy American small town. Everyone seems to love the happy clown, waving at him as he passes by. Bobble pauses in front of a house where a man is mowing the lawn. He convinces the man to stop his yard work and join him, and the two happily head down the sidewalk together. The girl is a little confused by this show. There's not much in the way of jokes, but she decides to keep watching anyway. Bobble and his new friend stop in front of a house that is painted to resemble a circus tent. This must be where Bobble lives. He invites the man in, and they both enter the house. Inside, Bobble motions for the man to sit while he prepares some refreshments. The girl watches as Bobble moves to the kitchen. There, he begins sharpening knives as he explains directly to the camera the best way to prepare meat, the way the skin must carefully be removed from the flesh, and how the bones should be saved for future soup stocks. The girl watches with fascination as Bobble teaches his special lesson. Maybe this is a good show after all. Maybe this is her new favorite show. The girl gets up, her brother still asleep, and heads to the kitchen. She pulls out a drawer to help her reach the counter where the knife block is located, and pulls out the meat cleaver. She looks at it gleaming in the light, entranced by its sharp, shiny edge. The girl returns to the living room and gets up onto the couch next to her sleeping brother. She watches as Bobble steps away from his pot of red, boiling meat and looks right into the camera. The girl stands up and holds up the meat cleaver. Bobble walks towards the camera with fascination in his eyes, as if he can see through the screen and is watching the girl. She slowly raises the knife above her head as Bobble starts whispering, Come on, do it, licking his lips in anticipation. The girl pauses for a second, looks at her sleeping brother one more time, and brings the cleaver down. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-993, also known as Bobble the Clown. But first, there's something I need from you. I need your help to spread the word about some of the lesser-known anomalies in the SCP Foundation's archives, and the best way you can help is to subscribe, turn on notifications, and then go tell your friends to do the same. This will help me bring you more and more SCP videos. Now, back to our file. SCP-993 is the designation the SCP Foundation has given to a children's television program entitled Bobble the Clown. At first glance, the Bobble the Clown show appears to be a standard children's educational cartoon with bright colors, a mascot, and a rote formula that involves the titular character of Bobble the Clown learning a new skill or engaging in a new activity. The program appears to have no recurring supporting cast, with Bobble being the only character who returns to each episode. The settings usually change between episodes as well, with Bobble often being seen in a new or unique location. Despite appearing as a show made for children, the anomalous properties exhibited by this strange television program make themselves apparent almost immediately. First, anyone older than the age of 10 who watches the show will immediately fall unconscious as soon as it begins and will remain in a comatose state until the program ends. Upon waking, they will report having felt a painful, stabbing headache just prior to falling unconscious. The show's most disturbing property, though, is what has been described by those under the age of 10 who are able to view the program. They report seeing Bobble the Clown teach lessons similar to the way many children's shows extol the virtues of good hygiene or going to bed on time. But with Bobble, the lessons are quite different. Topics that Bobble has presented lessons on and encouraged children to try have included torture, murder, and even cannibalism. As the subject watches, 
the lessons appear to become ingrained in their minds. And repeated exposure to the show has resulted in permanent effects that resemble symptoms of psychosis and schizophrenia. Documented episodes of Bobble the Clown have included Bobble in the Big City, in which Bobble appears in a large United States city reminiscent of New York, and instructs the viewer on various ways to avoid detection when lighting fires with common resources like mosquito coils. The episode ends with Bobble setting fire to a large building before he exits the screen. The camera continues to stay locked on the burning building for several more minutes as the sound of screams can be heard. In another titled Bobble's Sneaky Saturday, Bobble is again in a major city, this time one that looks similar to London, England, with the Elizabeth Tower containing Big Ben visible in the background. In this episode, Bobble is shown to be quietly following a woman as she walks into her home. Once she arrives, Bobble attacks her with a large butcher knife before giving the audience tips on how to remain unnoticed in crowded places. Bobble gets the truth, finds the clown in a prisoner of war camp, where Bobble is shown torturing a captured soldier as he asks him nonsensical questions that the soldier cannot possibly answer. This continues until the prisoner dies, after which Bobble details methods for inflicting painful but non-lethal injuries. Bobble Hates You is one of the most unnerving of the documented episodes, and consists of Bobble sitting alone in a blank room, silently and angrily staring at the viewer for a full 30 minutes. But the strangest of all is from an episode title filled with expletives, in which Bobble appears to be in a Foundation Secure Site video archive room, the same one where recordings of Bobble the Clown are stored. In this episode, a rage-filled Bobble describes methods for breaching several SCPs' containment. He then gives personal details about the researchers assigned to these SCPs, including their daily routines, before offering several potential ways to murder them. An interesting detail about this episode, at one point, an animated depiction of a particular SCP Foundation researcher is seen to walk past Bobble. A clock on the wall shows the time, and this same researcher later confirmed that they did, in fact, walk through the video archive at this exact time, but had no recollection of seeing an animated clown filming a television program in the room when they did so. Episodes of Bobble the Clown continue to be broadcast from an unknown source, but future episodes are to be intercepted using Protocol Upsilon Beta 3 to prevent them from being seen by the public. All broadcasts are recorded for the Foundation's archives, and in order to perform research on the anomaly, subjects under the age of 10 must be used to view them. Once the viewers have described what takes place in the episode, they are then to immediately be administered Class A amnestics. Despite the danger these episodes pose to those who view them, since they are able to be reliably blocked from public broadcast, SCP-993 has been classified as safe, and for now, Bobble the Clown appears to be contained as well as it can be. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, and once again, please join me on my mission by subscribing, turning on notifications, and telling a friend to do the same, so we can continue delving further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives. A child is sleeping happily in their bed, dreaming of Christmas morning. What they don't hear as they sleep is the sound of SCP-4666 slipping into their room. SCP-4666 watches the child for just a moment before reaching into a giant bag. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-4666, also known as the Yule Man. SCP-4666 is thought to be a single humanoid entity, but one that has been alive for an incredibly long time. Those who have come into contact with SCP-4666 and live to tell the tale describe him as being very tall, between 2 and 2.3 meters. He also appears to be very old and very thin. He always appears without clothing, even when the weather is below freezing and would be much too cold for any normal human to survive. Though the true extent of his anomalous properties are still unknown, SCP-4666 seems to be able to travel instantaneously to any location on Earth above the 40th line of North Latitude, and may actually be able to travel anywhere on the planet. Encounters with SCP-4666 have only been reported during a very specific time of year, 
a period of 12 nights, running from the night of December 21st to the early morning hours of January 2nd. This period is known as SCP-4666's active phase, and the encounters with the anomalous humanoid creature have been termed Weissnacht events. During these events, SCP-4666 appears at family dwellings, all of which so far have a few things in common. One, they are all isolated in rural areas. Two, they are in locations with snow that covers the area for the duration of the event. And three, they are all home to a family with at least one child under the age of eight. In places that match all of those characteristics, Weissnacht events sometimes occur and always follow the same basic progression. During the first seven nights, the children will report seeing a strange figure within the vicinity of the home. The entity will seem to be watching the home from a distance, such as from across a field or from the edge of a nearby forest. Some children have even reported waking up at night to find SCP-4666 watching them sleep through a window. On nights 8 through 11, other family members will report hearing the entity, such as footsteps on the roof or in the attic. A bad-smelling odor will also start to be noticed in the house, but no source of the smell is ever found. These strange occurrences will often lead the family to think their house may be haunted, or that they're being terrorized by a madman. Finally, on the twelfth night, one of two scenarios can occur. In the first, which happens roughly 15% of the time, Families will often report that they heard footsteps during the night inside of their house, but there is never any sign of forced entry like broken windows or doors. In the morning, the children will find crudely made toys at the foot of their beds. For the lucky ones, this is the end of the Weissnacht event for them. The roughly 85% who experience the other scenario are considerably less lucky. In the vast majority of cases, the twelfth night is a horrible experience. SCP-4666 still enters the home on the final night, but rather than leave presents for the children, it incapacitates the family and moves them all into a single room where it proceeds to kill them one by one in view of the rest of the family. The exact method of killing varies from event to event, but there's almost always an element of torture that occurs before they are finally killed and this torture may serve a ritualistic purpose. The entire family is killed except for one of the children who is under the age of eight. This child is instead abducted and placed into a giant bag SCP-4666 carries with it. SCP-4666's existence was first noted in 1974 by the Foundation's then new Anomalous Signature Recognition Program which alerted the Foundation to several suspiciously similar home invasions and murders that occurred throughout the Northern Hemisphere on the night of January 1st. Further research uncovered evidence for what was most likely other Weissnacht events every single year, dating back all the way to the late 18th century, with there being, on average, a little more than three events per year. And there's even been evidence of references to what may be SCP-4666 dating all the way back to the 1st and 2nd century AD. Identical fingerprints have been found at all of the houses which match the conditions for Weissnacht events, and have been matched to a recovered partial print from all the way back in 1873. These fingerprints have characteristics that don't match any known human fingerprints, and the human-like white hairs that have also been recovered do not appear to contain human DNA, or any DNA at all for that matter. In the rare Weissnacht events where SCP-4666 does not murder the family and gifts are left behind, the gifts are anything but normal. The gifts, known as SCP-4666-As, appear to be made from the bodies of children that SCP-4666 abducted from other homes. In one case, from 2018, at the home of a family in Alaska, a life-size doll made from the body of a female child was left behind. The doll was wearing a dirty dress made from sewn-together rags that was in some places sewn directly to the skin. Her mouth had been sewn shut and painted red with human blood. Another child's fingernails had been glued over her own, and three fingers were missing completely. The scalp had also been replaced with another child's scalp and hair like a crude wig. Worst of all, 
Both eyes had been removed and replaced with two stones which were painted to look like eyes. But most frightening of all was that the child who had been turned into a doll was somehow still alive. Authorities took the girl to a hospital where she was able to give a brief interview. She explained that the man who abducted her had killed her parents before putting her into a giant bag where there were other children too. SCP-4666 took the children somewhere deep below the earth in a cave system full of ice and bones. There, they were forced to make crude toys until they couldn't go on any longer, at which point they became toys. The girl, now known to be Ekaterina Morozova, had been abducted two years previously in a known Weissnacht event. She survived for only 18 hours after being discovered. An autopsy revealed many terrible injuries, and the cause of death was found to be from severe, sustained malnourishment. SCP-4666 has been classified as Keter and is currently not contained. The Foundation monitors web traffic and law enforcement channels for any evidence of SCP-4666 activity, and especially any potential Weissnacht events, such as cases of stalking reported during the 12-night active phase or other strange phenomena at houses with young children. Should a Weissnacht event be suspected to be in progress, the nearest containment task force is dispatched to attempt to contain SCP-4666 using the standard PDP-8 humanoid first contact protocols. So far, no such containment attempt has been successful. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, and be sure to subscribe as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives. It's 1916, right in the middle of World War I, and a British soldier is huddled in a trench, occasionally peeking over the top. He's supposed to be on watch, but there's little to see in the darkness that hangs over no man's land. But then, he spots something. Something big. It's a shadowy figure, only about 20 feet away, and it looks like it's digging in the mud. It's too dark to make out what he's looking at, so the soldier shoots a flare into the sky, lighting up the battlefield with a dull red light. Now he can see it clearly, and it's like nothing he's ever seen before. A huge, terrifying monster, picking up bodies out of the mud. The soldier can only stare, petrified by what he's seeing in front of him, when the creature suddenly turns to stare back at him and smiles. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-3456, also known as the Orcadian Horseman. SCP-3456 is the designation given to a group of quadrupeds, of which the exact number that exists is unknown. These entities resemble horses, though with some marked differences. SCP-3456s lack any hair, and their thick skin is translucent, revealing the fat and muscle underneath. They have three-toed hooves, and strangest of all, they have one or more human-shaped torsos fused to their backs. Each torso has a pair of arms and a head, but no legs, the torso seeming to meld directly into the back of the creature's horse-like body. The arms are much longer than those of a human, with a total wingspan that is double the anomaly's height. The arms are so long, they typically drag along the ground when the creature moves. At the end of each arm are five sharpened bones that protrude from where fingers would normally be. Instead of a nose, most instances of SCP-3456 have a hole in the middle of the face, which is capable of producing a high-pitched scream that is as loud as a jet engine. SCP-3456 instances vary in size, with the largest recorded manifestation standing 30 meters tall and 15 meters long. Their bodies have also shown to be quite resilient and are completely impervious to conventional weaponry. The anomalous creatures have displayed a high level of adaptive intelligence, using complex tactics like setting up ambushes through the use of property destruction and psychological manipulation to lure targets into traps. This high level of intelligence has led many at the Foundation to believe that SCP-3456 is sapient. Any direct observation of an SCP-3456 instance will cause the entity to become aware of its observer, at which point it will display this awareness by turning in the exact direction of the observer. 
once an instance of SCP-3456 has spotted its observer, it will engage in predatory behavior, stalking its witness and pursuing them far beyond the initial site of manifestation, all the while concealing itself and using camouflage as it chases them. SCP-3456 will repeat this behavior over and over, intentionally letting itself be seen by observers over and over as it hunts down and takes each one until it has captured a large number of individuals and suddenly dematerializes. It's currently unknown where SCP-3456 takes its victims, or what happens to them once it dematerializes, nor is it known how many victims 3456 needs to capture before it is satisfied and dematerializes for good, as the number taken has varied between instances. It's not currently understood why, but SCP-3456 is either unwilling or unable to cross bodies of fresh water, and making it to the other side of a fresh water source like a river, lake, or even a stream is the only currently known way to escape the anomaly once it begins its pursuit. Instances of SCP-3456 typically appear near sites of mass human suffering, such as battlefields and natural or man-made disasters and there have been numerous reports and sightings of 3456s at historical events throughout the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries, with multiple manifestations often appearing at the same event. One Foundation report contains an account of an SCP-3456 instance appearing during the First World War at the Battle of the Somme. Rumors spread through the British troops in their trenches of the appearance of a mythical creature many believed to be the Nukalavi a horse-like demon with origins in Orcadian mythology. Like many SCPs, this ancient folktale turned out to have very real origins. British infantryman Dave Harkin kept a journal which described giant hoof prints appearing in the battlefield mud, and soldiers disappearing under mysterious circumstances, appearing to be killed by forces even more terrifying than what the war could produce. Harkin describes one soldier who was firing on advancing Germans when the mud beneath his feet started boiling. Before anyone could react, mud went flying everywhere, and everyone was knocked off their feet. The soldier was gone, not even a body part remained, and Harkin was sure he saw bony protrusions reaching up out of the mud underneath the soldier just before he disappeared. Not long after, Harkin spotted the Orcadian horsemen on the battlefield, and the horsemen spotted Harkin. He watched as the instance of SCP-3456 picked bodies out of the mud and carried them off into the darkness. He took several shots at the entity with his rifle, but the bullets had no effect. As days passed, the half-man, half-horse continued to appear night after night, always doing the same thing, picking up injured soldiers off the battlefield and taking them into the darkness. It would always look back at Harkand, seemingly taunting him or inviting him to try following it. Soon more instances of SCP-3456 appeared, many with more than one torso on their back. And then they began laying traps, burying themselves in the mud and waiting for the soldiers to rush over them. Dave Harkand was declared missing in action at the Battle of the Sum, and it's presumed he was taken by the same instance of SCP-3456 that he first observed. Another first-hand account of an encounter with SCP-3456 occurred following the 2011 earthquake and subsequent nuclear disaster in Fukushima, Japan. With over 2,500 missing persons, several manifestations of SCP-3456 were reported in the areas affected by the quake, and SCP Foundation reconnaissance teams were sent to investigate two of which were quickly wiped out during the encounters with 3456s. One squad, after exploring the evacuated city and not finding anything, spotted an instance of SCP-3456 standing motionless in the middle of an intersection. As they laid eyes on the Orcadian horseman, the human torso that was hanging limp off the motionless horse's body stood upright and began swinging its arms, damaging and destroying the buildings and structures around it. It then turned towards the team and emitted an ear-shatteringly loud shriek from the hole where its nose should be before beginning its pursuit. The team immediately began evacuation procedures, even ordering a drone strike in an attempt to slow down the chasing anomaly. The team took shelter in an abandoned high-rise building, but knew their only chance of escape was if they could make it over the nearest body of fresh water 
which would mean crossing a bridge over the Arakawa River, which was a kilometer away. The team was 50 yards away from the bridge with no further signs of SCP-3456 when one emerged from a side street right next to them. Small arms fire was used against the creature and two rocket-propelled grenades were fired at it, but all had no effect. A flashbang detonated in the anomaly's face bought enough time for some of the squad to make it across the bridge and escape. But two members of the team were carried away by SCP-3456, with the last image captured by one of the squad's helmet-mounted cams being a shot of the Orcadian horseman smiling just before it demanifested. SCP-3456 is currently uncontained, and due to its extremely dangerous nature and the lack of any containment procedures, it has been designated Keter Class. Any personnel who observe the entity are to be treated with Class G amnestics, and their assigned treatment facility must be located within one kilometer of a body of fresh water. The Foundation has an ongoing project to attribute any historical references to SCP-3456 to myth, shell shock, hysteria, or PTSD, and any reports of loss of life or property damage involving the anomaly are to be replaced with explanations that attribute the cause to other natural or man-made events. Regions where SCP-3456 is more likely to appear are to be closely monitored with personnel ready to assist in evacuation efforts, but above all else, direct observation of SCP-3456 must be avoided, since once that has happened, there's very little even the SCP Foundation can do to protect you. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, and be sure to subscribe as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives. A young man is with a group of friends eating lunch in their college cafeteria. His friends are talking and laughing, but they soon notice that the young man has hardly said a word. He seems distracted by something. Sitting a few tables away is a young woman. She's eating by herself, and in fact, the whole table around her is empty. As he stares, one of the young man's friends leans over and tells him to snap out of it, that the young woman he is staring at is weird and he's better off leaving her alone. The young man doesn't think she looks weird. In fact, he thinks she looks nice. Plus, he's seen her in one of his classes and she doesn't seem strange, just shy. The young man's friends watch as he gets up from his table and goes to sit across from the young woman. She seems surprised when he tells her hi, as if she doesn't know what to say back. The young man tells her that he's seen her in his anatomy class and introduces himself to her, extending a hand. After a brief moment, she returns his handshake. She's seen him in the class too. The two start talking having one of those awkward first conversations that happen with someone you like. They talk a bit about their class, they both find it very difficult, about their majors, both pre-med, and where they live, he on campus, her off. The young man needs to get going to his next class, but he asks if she wants to study together sometime. She seems hesitant, but then agrees to at least exchange phone numbers. The young man walks away from the table with a big smile on his face. That night, the young man is studying in his dorm. His roommate asks him if he wants to come with him to a party, but the young man tells him no, he has a big test coming up and he needs to focus on it. His roommate leaves and he checks his phone for the hundredth time that night. Still no messages. Just as he sets it back on his desk though, it chimes. There's a text. And it's from her. This stuff is really hard. Do you want to study together? The young man is excited. Of course he wants to study together. Where? Her apartment? Great! The young man doesn't waste any time, grabs his jacket and his books, and heads out. It's starting to snow lightly as he bikes to her apartment, which is a couple miles off campus. He's feeling a little nervous as he locks up his bike and walks to her door. He knocks, and the door opens. There she is, the young woman, looking just as nice as she did in the cafeteria. The young woman shows him into her apartment. She offers him a glass of wine before they sit down and get to studying. In between quizzing each other on the human circulatory system, the two chat, getting to know each other a little better. Eventually, she tells him that she has something she needs to ask him. She wants to know if he thinks she's weird. The young man is taken aback and answers no, not at all. She tells him that she knows it sounds stupid, but when she was younger, a rumor went around her school that she was some kind of witch. She didn't know if maybe someone from her childhood was still spreading that story around. The young man hadn't heard that but he wanted to know why someone would think that. Because you do dumb stuff when you're a kid, she tells him. 
You read about a ritual in an old book and try it just for fun. Nothing happens, of course, but don't tell anyone that you tried or you'll never live it down. They look outside, and the snow has really started to fall. It's getting late, too. Does he want to stay the night? The young man would love to. The bike ride back to campus will be much easier in the morning. She tells him to wait just a minute and goes into her bedroom. The young man is nervous. He's never been in this kind of situation before, if it even is a situation at all. He's never had a girlfriend or even kissed a girl before. Could tonight be the night? The bedroom door opens and the young woman comes out with blankets and pillows for the couch. She tells him to make himself comfortable and she'll see him in the morning. The young man is disappointed, but what did he expect? She just wanted someone to study with. It was dumb of him to think that she might like him just because he had a little crush on her. Maybe they'll be great friends, though. The young man lies on the couch and watches the snow fall outside. It's so peaceful and quiet here, not like the dorm where someone is always making noise. He watches snowflakes pass by the window as his eyes start to grow heavy, and he drifts to sleep. What was that? The young man jolts up. He could have sworn he heard something. He listens, but now there is only silence. He lies back down and closes his eyes. It must have been a dream. No, there it is again. A popping noise. Then more sounds, snapping and ripping like moist meat squished and torn. What is going on? The young man gets up off the couch and looks around. It sounds like it's coming from the bedroom. Her bedroom. The door is closed, though. There don't appear to be any lights on. But the strange sounds continue. The young man doesn't know what's happening in there, but he feels extremely nervous. He takes a step towards the door and the noises stop. What should he do? Will she be mad if he knocks? But what if something is happening in there? What if she needs his help? He has to risk it. He needs to check that everything is alright. The young man knocks lightly on the door. No response. He knocks a little harder. Hello? Are you okay? Still nothing. Is he really going to do this? His heart is pounding. He grips the doorknob and slowly twists it, cracking the door open ever so slightly. It's dark in her room. A small beam of moonlight coming through the frosty window is the only source of light. He opens the door a bit wider. I hope it's okay if I come in, he says. I heard something and... <gasps> the young man freezes in terror. Lying there on the bed, illuminated by the moonlight, is the girl. But not the whole girl. It's just her body. Her head has been ripped off at the neck. Unfortunately, this student will never get ahead in his anatomy class, because even something as innocent as a study date can turn bad quickly when your partner is the strange and dangerous creature which many refer to as the Penangalan, but is better known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-1060. SCP-1060 is the designation given to the human female, both body and head included, who answers to the name Adila. In interviews with the subject, she has reported her age as being 22 years old, and she is fluent in the Malay language, with some additional proficiency in Malaysian English, which is a form of English that, unsurprisingly, combines elements of British English and Malaysian. The subject has told interviewers that she is trained as an obstetrics nurse, also known as an OB, a type of nurse that specializes in helping to care for women and fetuses during pregnancy, labor, and childbirth. It would seem at first glance that SCP-1060 is a completely normal young woman, and that is true, but only during the day. At night, SCP-1060 undergoes some rather strange changes to her physiology. In the evening, roughly 80 minutes after SCP-1060 has fallen asleep, her head and certain internal organs, including her heart, lungs, liver, and the majority of her digestive system, will physically detach from the rest of her body. This occurs with a sudden jerking motion that rips the head and organs from the body leaving a large gaping hole in the subject's neck. The now detached head and trailing organs will begin to levitate through a process that has yet to be explained by SCP Foundation researchers. They will begin to float around the room they are in as other physical changes take place. The subject's tongue will increase in size to roughly 22 centimeters in length and will begin flicking at the air much in the same way that a snake does. The subject's upper and lower canine teeth also increase in both size and sharpness. All while the body her head was once firmly affixed to will remain lying in the same position as when the head detached. If there is food present, SCP-1060 will use its dangling intestines as a sort of prehensile limb, lifting the food with its guts up into its mouth, where it will tear at it with its razor-sharp teeth. 
Once it has finished feeding, the disembodied head will dip its exposed organs into a tub of rice wine vinegar. Exposing the organs to the vinegar has an immediate effect, causing them to shrink in size, such that they will then fit into the exposed neck hole on the waiting, headless body and can be stuffed back into the body cavity. The head then appears to seamlessly reattach itself to the body. The tongue and teeth return to their normal size, and no signs remain that the head of this body was just floating around of its own volition moments ago. SCP-1060 claims to have no knowledge that any of this takes place, insisting that she sleeps quite normally. Her complete unawareness of her condition has led her to be very insistent that she be released from Foundation containment, and frequently requests that she be allowed to contact her family members. So far, both of these requests have been denied. A head that rips itself from its own body at night and flies around with its exposed organs dangling beneath it is an extremely unsettling image. But this is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what makes SCP-1060 truly horrifying. Just as the many Malay legends and myths describe, this creature's favorite foods are children and unborn fetuses carried by pregnant women. The Foundation learned this fact in a particularly unsettling incident, which has been designated SCP-1060.01A. During this incident, a researcher who was in her second trimester of pregnancy entered the containment chamber of SCP-1060 while it was engaged in its nighttime cycle behavior in order to refill the basin of vinegar that would allow it to return to its complete human form. Despite not having previously shown aggressive behavior towards staff, as soon as the researcher entered the chamber, SCP-1060 immediately flew at her. It used its dangling intestines to restrain the researcher, and results were not pretty. Sadly, neither the researcher nor the fetus that she was carrying survived. Following this incident, the containment procedures for SCP-1060 were updated to specify that members of staff who are pregnant or suspect that they may be pregnant are not allowed into the containment chamber during its nighttime cycle. While the origins of SCP-1060 and just how this young woman came to possess these anomalous properties are unknown, there are numerous tales, most originating from Malaysian folklore, that describe a creature that is quite similar. Known as the Panangalan, it is a creature akin to a vampire, though with one key difference. This monster chose to become what it is. Malaysian myths tell of a method some women use to become Panangalan, where they will meditate while taking a ritual bath in vinegar. Their entire body must be submerged except for their head, and through a black magic process, they gain the ability to have their head detach from their body and turn into something that looks quite similar to SCP-1060. Some modern interpretations of the legend describe it not as a choice, but as a curse, or as the result of breaking a demonic pact, but they all have the same result for the woman in question. As SCP researchers continue to look into this bizarre and quite dangerous anomalous entity, she is kept contained in a humanoid observation and detention cell at all times in Site-33. While she is in her complete human form during the day, she is given food from the on-site cafeteria, but during her nighttime phase, she is provided with 0.8 kilograms of human placental material, and she is to have access to a basin that contains at least 4 liters of rice wine vinegar. The lack of knowledge about just what this anomaly is and the threat it poses to certain populations has led to it being classified as Euclid, and though progress has been slow, it is hoped that one day it will be better understood, and perhaps once it is, Adila can finally go home. Now go watch the file for SCP-015-IT, The Boogeyman, for another anomaly that you may find yourself pitying as much as fearing. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives. A climber struggles on the side of the mountain. He's so close to the summit of Mount Everest that he can taste it. He just needs to triumph over this last difficult section, and he will have fulfilled his lifetime dream of standing at the top of the world. He needs to hurry, though. At this altitude, the air is so thin and the temperature is so cold that your body is slowly dying. There's a reason this topmost section of the mountain is known as the Death Zone. He glances down behind him and spots something. Is that another climber? That's strange, he thinks. He was at the very back of his group, and there shouldn't have been anyone else coming up behind him. It must be a solo climber. The soloist doesn't look to be moving, though. He's just staring at him, and the climber can't seem to take his eyes off him. 
Suddenly, the climber starts feeling odd. He begins to feel warm and comfortable. The aches and pains of the long journey melt away. He decides to sit down on a small ledge and relax. He watches as the solo climber comes towards him. He must be a professional with the way he effortlessly moves up the mountain. He watches him make great time, getting closer and closer. He loses sight as the solo climber reaches the same difficult section he had been struggling with. He imagines the solo climber will soon zip past him on his way to the summit. But just then, the soloist pops up right in front of him. He clasps his hands on the climber's shoulders and pulls him close, staring into his eyes with those dark black goggles. They feel like they're pulling him into their depths, and there's nothing he can do to resist it. The climber tries to scream, but all that comes out of his mouth is silence. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-1529, also known as King of the Mountain. But first, a quick personal request from me. I need your help to spread the word about the lesser-known anomalies in the SCP Foundation's archives. The best thing you can do to help me is subscribe, turn on notifications, and then go tell your friends to do the same. This is a huge help and will let me bring you more and more SCP videos. Now, back to our file. SCP-1529 is an entity with a humanoid appearance that resides near the summit of Mount Everest in Nepal. It is only found above 8,000 meters, which places it in the part of the mountain referred to as the Death Zone, where oxygen levels are too low to support human life for any extended period of time. It is roughly equivalent to an average human male in height and weight, and its outer appearance resembles normal mountaineering clothes, with a heavy parka, pants, and boots that are all white in color. Its face is completely obscured by a large hood, with the only visible detail being a pair of large, dark goggles. SCP-1529 has never been seen wearing any other outfit, and in fact, it is unknown whether these are articles of clothing at all, or if they are actually a part of its body. The SCP Foundation first became aware of an anomalous entity lurking near the top of Mount Everest in the 1970s, when climbing expeditions to the summit became more commonplace among professional and amateur mountaineers alike. Rumors began to spread and told of a monster that was killing unfortunate climbers. In 1999, the body of George Mallory, who is believed to be the first person to reach the top of Mount Everest, was located, and photographic film found on his body was developed. From those pictures, it is now known that SCP-1529 was present at least as early as his 1924 expedition. When sufficient daylight and a lack of cloud cover allows observation of the peak by telescope, SCP-1529 can be seen sitting or lying on the mountain, apparently motionless in an inactive state. These motionless periods have been seen to last anywhere from 17 minutes to as long as 8 months. When active though, it can be seen summiting and descending the upper portion of the mountain, though it never uses any climbing tools and will ignore established climbing ropes and ladders that have been installed by other climbers. It has also been observed easily traversing portions of the mountain that are considered too difficult or altogether impossible by experienced climbers. Additionally, SCP-1529 is not impacted by the freezing temperatures, extreme wind speeds, or low oxygen levels at the top of the mountain, and it has never once been seen to stumble, fall, or even lose its grip. It is unknown what prompts SCP-1529 to become active or enter a resting inactive phase, nor has there been any established correlation of these phases to weather, time of year, or traffic on the mountain. Its active periods have been observed to last between mere hours to several days, but the exact amount is hard to know for sure. Nighttime observation of 1529 has so far been impossible even with thermal imaging cameras since it produces no heat, with its temperatures being the same as that of the surrounding environment. When in its active phase, if a human climber passes the 8,000 meter mark, then SCP-1529 will begin to make its way towards them, putting itself in the path between the climber and either the summit if they are ascending, or their camp if they are descending. It seems to prefer to go after solo climbers, or those that are significantly ahead or behind their climbing group, but it has been observed targeting climbers in a group when a solo opportunity is not available. Once SCP-1529 is within eyesight of its targeted climber, it will attempt to gain their attention and then lock eyes with them, which produces a hypnotic effect. The climber will find that they are unable to break eye contact with SCP-1529, and will then begin to experience feelings of warmth and euphoria, similar to the effects of hypothermia and hypoxia, also known as altitude sickness. The victim will feel the overwhelming desire to sit down where they are, and once they stop moving, 
SCP-1529 will quickly close the distance between them. Once SCP-1529 reaches the victim, death is almost a certainty. An examination of bodies has shown the cause to be from hypothermia. Strangely, it's been observed that victims seem to succumb within just one to two hours after having first made eye contact with SCP-1529, a period of time much shorter than usual for climbers trapped on the summit of Everest. After death, the victim's bodies experience an accelerated rate of decay, and after mere hours or days, the bodies become rotted and mummified at a level comparable to bodies that have been exposed to the wind and cold of the mountain for decades. Many of the over 200 deaths on Mount Everest have been attributed to SCP-1529, and the rare survivor of an encounter is almost always due to the intervention of another mountaineer, who was able to offer assistance to the entranced climber before SCP-1529 was able to reach them. There have been several notable reports from survivors of interactions with SCP-1529. One, known as Incident-1529-1, is also the only documented instance of SCP-1529 descending below the 8,000-meter mark. During the incident, the entity entered Camp 5, located on the northern approach of the mountain at 7,775 meters, which resulted in multiple deaths, including two Foundation personnel who were operating the monitoring posts. One climber, who had initially believed to have been killed in the incident, was discovered to still be alive two days later when Foundation personnel were conducting investigations at the camp. He was safely removed from the mountain, though he required the amputation of several frostbitten fingers and toes. During an interview with a Foundation agent, they described spotting SCP-1529 just ten minutes after leaving the summit of the mountain. After locking eyes with the entity, they began to feel happy, comfortable, and relieved, like they were back at home next to a warm fire. But then suddenly the warmth was gone, and they experienced a sensation of cold more powerful than anything they had felt before. They were stuck, and could only watch as 1529 made its way towards them. When it finally reached them, it placed its hands on their shoulders and pulled them up into its face so that they were staring right into its black goggles. Images began to appear in the dark depths of the goggles. People warm and happy, sitting next to fires, in hot baths, or sunning on a beach. They tried to resist the strange pull of the creature with all of their might. They then heard something in their mind. A question from SCP-1529. It asked, You would refuse my gift. The stranded climber struggled to answer, using all of their willpower and strength to move their lips and whisper a single word. Yes. SCP-1529 responded by showing more images of people, but this time, they were bodies lying dead in the snow. Countless victims trapped on Mount Everest forever. SCP-1529 made them watch their deaths play out in long, drawn-out detail, a witness to every second of their demise. The climber was sure they would soon join them, but then they found something deep inside of them, a spark of life, a will to resist. They clenched their fist, and with their final ounce of strength, they punched SCP-1529. The goggles appeared to crack, and the next thing the climber knew, they were woken up by the Foundation recovery team. Following this encounter, the climber never attempted to summit another mountain. When they eventually passed away some years later, an autopsy revealed that their cause of death was consistent with extreme hypothermia, frostbite, and cerebral edema, despite not having been in a cold environment or above 500 meters in altitude in the previous 12 months. SCP-1529 has been classified as Euclid and is to be kept under telescope and satellite surveillance whenever possible. Though telescope observation should make use of a delayed video feed, as observers have reported seeing SCP-1529 appearing to stare back at them, and reported feeling symptoms consistent with an encounter, including hypothermia and frostbite. The Foundation maintains communication with civilian mountaineering expeditions to prevent summiting attempts when SCP-1529 is active. The bodies of any victims are to be removed from the mountain, if possible, for autopsy, with their deaths being officially classified as having been from natural causes related to altitude sickness and hypothermia. Any survivors of encounters with SCP-1529 are to be debriefed and administered amnestics. Mobile Task Force Psi-29029, also known as Alpine Echo, is to remain on standby at all times at a permanent monitoring station, with on-duty members remaining in a pressurized environment acclimatized to 7,900 meters above sea level, allowing them to quickly deploy via helicopter if need be. Finally, and most troubling, 
is that aerial surveillance of another mountain has revealed an individual similar in appearance to SCP-1529. The location remains classified, and the local government has prohibited climbing on the peak, so threats to humanity are minimal at this time. But the Foundation will continue to monitor it and other mountains for anomalous activity. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob. And once again, please join me on my mission by subscribing, turning on notifications, and telling a friend to join us as well, as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives. A businessman steps out of his hotel room holding a silver ice bucket. He looks up and down the empty hallway until he spots what he was searching for, an ice machine. He slips his room key into his pocket and heads down the hall towards the machine. As he waits for the machine to fill his bucket with ice, he glances around and spots something. There at the end of the hall, it looks like someone is sticking their head out from around the corner, watching him. But then they suddenly disappear. He doesn't think much of it. It's probably just some kid playing around. His ice bucket is only a quarter full. These old machines can be really slow. He looks around again and sees the same head poking around the corner, looking at him. He thinks it might be a young girl, but as he squints to get a better look, she disappears around the corner once again. The ice machine finally finishes filling his bucket. He picks it up and starts to walk back towards his room, but stops. He turns around and looks down the hall to see the same girl there again, watching him with a creepy, unblinking stare. Do you want something? The man asks down the hallway, but there's no response from the girl. She simply keeps looking at him. Are you just going to keep staring at me? That's exactly what she does. The businessman is really starting to get annoyed now. All he wanted to do was unwind with a drink after a long day at a job site. Why does this girl want to keep messing with him? He starts walking down the hall towards her. I don't know what you think you're playing at, the businessman says as he walks down the hallway in her direction. When he gets halfway to her, she disappears behind the corner once again. But the businessman keeps walking and talking to her. But if you don't stop messing with me, I'll... He rounds the corner and sees... Nothing. There's a short hallway that leads to a maintenance closet, but no girl. Did she somehow slip inside the closet? He didn't hear the door, but she couldn't be anywhere else. He sets down the ice bucket on the floor and reaches towards the handle with more than a little apprehension. He feels uneasy for some reason, and maybe even a little scared. But there's nothing to be afraid of. It was just a girl, wasn't it? He grabs the handle and opens the door. Aha! I've got you. There's nothing in the closet. Just a couple of mops, a bucket, and some cleaning supplies. He pushes the mops aside as if she could somehow be hiding behind them, but no, there's no place to hide or secret doors to be found. He really must have imagined the whole thing. It was a long day, and a long flight before that. He needed that drink. He sticks his room key into the door and pulls it out. A green light flashes and the lock clicks open. He grabs the handle to open the door when he realizes he's forgotten something. The ice bucket, the whole reason he left his room to begin with. He walks back down the hallway and past the ice ma- Wait a second. Where's the ice machine? Isn't this where it was? The alcove where he could have sworn he got ice just minutes before is empty. He looks around, up and down the hallway. Did he somehow get turned around? He walks to the end of the hall and turns the corner. Sitting there on the floor in front of the maintenance closet door is the ice bucket. He looks around, confusion on his face and picks up the ice bucket. Back at his room, he puts his room key into the door. The lock flashes red. He tries the key again, and once more it flashes red. He tries the key a third time, and as he does so, the door opens. He looks up to see a large man standing in front of him. Do you need something? The businessman is confused. What are you doing in my room? He asks. Your room, the large man responds. Yeah, room 237. The large man looks annoyed. He shoves past the businessman and points across the hall. The businessman follows his finger's direction to see that he's pointing at another door, one that has the number 237 next to it on the wall. The businessman looks at the number next to the door he's been trying to unlock, 239. The businessman laughs nervously at his mistake as the large man pushes past him again and closes the door behind him. Back in his room, the businessman can finally sit down and pour himself a drink. He takes two ice cubes from the bucket and drops them in his glass before taking a long sip. Ah. He turns on the TV, but after watching for a few minutes, he finds that he's having a hard time concentrating. Whatever this show is, it moves too fast and he can't keep track of what's happening. He turns off the TV and picks up a book instead, 
Maybe some reading will help him to relax and get his bearings. He still feels really off. He opens the book, but gets confused. Is this the same book he bought in the airport? It looks like it's written in a foreign language. It's just a bunch of squiggles. He tosses the book on the table and yawns. It's not that late, but he's feeling really tired. He gets up, kicks off his shoes, and lies down on the bed without bothering to undress. He's too tired for that. He mumbles to himself for a moment, half awake, talking about how he needs to return that foreign book when he goes back to the airport. What were they trying to do selling him something he can't even read? He continues to mumble about the things he'll do to the cashier who sold him the book for a while until he finally drifts off to sleep. His eyes open. It's dark. He must have been sleeping for a while. The room is cold, too. He goes to pull the blankets up over him, but immediately realizes that he can't move. Try as he might, his body won't respond. Not a single muscle. Only his eyes seem to work. He's completely paralyzed. He can't even yell for help. What happened? And what is he going to do? Did he have a stroke? Is he dying? As his mind races through all the different possibilities, he suddenly sees something. From his bed in the dark room, he can just barely make out the door to his hotel room, and he is terrified by what he can see coming through it. A figure has appeared in the door, literally in the door, as if it is phasing through the solid wood. The man is scared to death as the thing fully enters his room and turns to look right at him. The man wants to scream, but his mouth is still completely numb. The figure starts crawling towards him. He can see now that it's small, smooth, and completely white. He fights as hard as he can, willing his body to move. But nothing happens. He can't so much as whisper. The thing climbs up onto the bed and sits down right on his chest. He prays that he is dreaming, telling himself to wake up over and over again as the creature leans his face in close to his. It seems as if it is somehow looking at him with its smooth, eyeless sockets. It tilts its head slightly to the side, and... Welcome, I'm Dr. Bob, and we couldn't be happier that you've decided to stay with us as we delve into SCP-5172, an extremely dangerous anomaly that is known by the extremely non-threatening name of North American Hotel Ice Machines. SCP-5172 is a phenomenon that only affects guests staying at hotels located on the North American continent. It is unknown how or what causes these guests to become affected, but those that are will begin to notice something. Ice machines in the hallway of the hotel they are staying in. Now you might think this sounds perfectly normal. After all, don't most hotels have ice machines? If you just had this thought, then I have some bad news for you, because there is a high probability that you too may have been affected by SCP-5172. You see, ice machines are actually extremely uncommon in hotels, and it is likely that you have never actually seen one, or at least, not a real one. Allow me to explain. In the 1950s, the founder of the Holiday Inn chain of hotels, Kenan Williams, had an idea that he thought would set his hotel apart and attract customers, which was to offer more perks and amenities than his competitors. For example, he implemented a new policy where children would be allowed to stay for free, something most hotels charged extra for. Hotels at the time also had a policy of making their guests pay for ice, but Williams decided to change that by installing ice machines in his hotels. Sadly, the marketing stunt didn't work. The cost of the machines wasn't made up for in new customers, and the plan was discontinued by the mid-1960s. The vast majority of the machines were removed, with the rest being pulled from the hotels as they would break down, since they were no longer worth the expense of maintaining. Despite the fact that they only existed in hotels for a brief period of time, there is still a widely held belief among the public that ice machines can be found in nearly every hotel. In a poll of the general population conducted by the Foundation, over 80% of adults claim to have memories of seeing an ice machine in a hotel, a number that is quite literally impossible. Just where this mass delusion came from, or why it persists, is currently unknown, but it's theorized to be related to the SCP-5172 phenomenon in some way. The SCP Foundation first became aware of SCP-5172 in 1973 after a series of unsolved murders occurred at hotels in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Foundation investigators soon discovered the prevalence of false ice machine memories and installed a number of hidden cameras around the hotels in both their public spaces as well as in the rooms themselves. It was after viewing the footage captured by these cameras that the Foundation finally got their first look at just what happens during an occurrence of SCP-5172 which has been dubbed a Zalmunna event. The Zalmunna event is triggered whenever a guest at the hotel sees and then uses an ice machine. 
The moment they use the ice machine, the event cannot be stopped unless certain actions are taken. But more on that later. The targeted individual who used the ice machine will immediately begin to have the sense that they are being watched. This usually comes in the form of an unknown individual who appears to be looking at them from the end of the hall where the ice machine is located. Third-party observers are unable to see the person who is supposedly watching the target, nor do they appear on any recording devices, visual or otherwise. The targets have described the watchers in various ways, leading the Foundation to believe that they may actually be nothing more than hallucinations. Shortly after, the targeted individual will begin to experience feelings of confusion and fatigue, not dissimilar to the symptoms of early-stage dementia. The longer it takes the target to return to their hotel room, the more pronounced these feelings will become, and they will soon have issues completing everyday tasks and will experience short-term memory loss. Despite these feelings of fatigue and disorientation, targets report that their mind feels too active to fall asleep, anywhere other than a hotel room bed, that is. This feeling will usually cause the target to seek out their own hotel room, though they may have difficulty finding it due to their confused state. They don't need to sleep in their own room for the next stage of the Zalmunna event to be triggered, though. Sleeping in any hotel room will do. Once the target lies down in a hotel room bed, they will immediately enter the hypnagogic state, which is the confusing and dreamlike state that one experiences in between full sleep and waking. The temperature of the room will begin to lower during this period as well, until it reaches approximately 11 degrees Celsius or 51.8 degrees Fahrenheit. After about an hour, the target will enter a state of deep sleep, at which point SCP-5172-1 will finally make its appearance. The humanoid-like entity is quite diminutive in size, standing just 4 feet tall and appearing to weigh a little over 60 pounds. Its arms are twice as long as normal humans, though and the top of its head is enlarged as well. Though it is not visible to observers present in the room, cameras are able to record the creature. After phasing through the door of the hotel room, the 5172-1 entity will begin crawling towards the sleeping person, who will wake up to find that they are in a state of sleep paralysis. The entity will climb up onto the bed and sit on the person's chest. It will move its smooth-skinned face close to the targets before opening its mouth, revealing a long, thin, proboscis-like appendage that it inserts into the target's eye socket. It's long been theorized that it may be administering some type of paralytic or anesthesia directly into the brain, so that it can then engage in the next stage of the Zalmana event, harvesting. The 5172-1 entity's chest then opens to reveal a pair of tools. It will take the tools out of its chest and use them to begin extracting four centimeter cubes directly from the target's body flesh, muscle, organs, and even bone will all be cut and scooped out with the same ease, which it then places inside of its own chest cavity. While it starts the process extremely slow, collecting just two cubes per minute at first, it quickly ups its pace to as many as 50 cubes per minute, leading to the entire harvesting process typically lasting two to three hours. Once it has finished harvesting, the creature will simply place its tools back inside its chest cavity, crawl back towards the hotel room door, and phase through it once more. But the horror is far from over. SCP-5172-1 collects all of the organic material from the target during the harvesting process, all except for the central nervous system, which includes the spinal cord, peripheral nerves, the retinas, and the brain. These are left lying on the hotel room bed after 5172-1 carefully cut and scooped around them. And the truly horrifying aspect of the Zalmana event is that the target is still alive at this point and will continue to live for several more hours in this condition. Even worse, reports from targets who had the Zalmana event interrupted while in the middle of the harvesting process described being fully conscious the entire time. It now appears that the proboscis-like appendage that 5172-1 inserts into the target's eye does not appear to be an anesthetic agent at all, since the same rescued targets reported feeling excruciating pain. Instead, it seems that the purpose of the entity's appendage is to ensure that the victim stays conscious through the whole process, fully aware of each cube being removed from their body, helpless to do a thing to stop it. As mentioned, the triggering of a Zalmana event is not a guaranteed death sentence and can be stopped. While much faster than humans, SCP-5172-1 entities aren't especially strong and sustain damage much like a human would. Once it begins harvesting, the entity will become visible to others and can be terminated by the same methods that would kill a human, such as with gunshots or stab wounds. However, simply killing the entity isn't enough. 
the affected ice machine must be physically removed from the premises in order to prevent a new instance of SCP-5172-1 from materializing. Once triggered through the use of an affected ice machine, the only way to completely stop a Zalmana event is for the target to leave the hotel and sleep in a private residence, which will prevent SCP-5172-1 from appearing. If the target sleeps in any bed in the same or even a different hotel, the event will continue. Efforts are underway to better understand SCP-5172-1 entities by capturing a live specimen, but so far, all attempts have resulted in failure. Captured entities are capable of manifesting their tools and cutting out of containment, while all attempts at binding or otherwise tying down the creatures has led to them dying within several minutes. Autopsies of dead instances have revealed that, like us, they have a circulatory system, though its heart is located in its head, which explains how they can be killed by being shot or stabbed, but they lack respiratory and digestive organs. As you can imagine, the existence of SCP-5172 presents a problem for Foundation personnel and their business travel. Agents who must stay in hotels rather than SCP safe houses are briefed on the anomaly and required to wear heart rate monitors that can detect when an elevated heart rate occurs that may be connected to a Zalmana event. Social media, text messages, and other forms of communication from devices that are connected to hotel Wi-Fi systems are monitored at all times for any references to ice machines, and any mention triggers the dispatching of a containment team to the site who will attempt to identify and remove both the ice machine and the targeted individual from the premises. All ice machines discovered at locations thought to be affected by SCP-5172 are then relocated to Site-30. One final note, while SCP-5172 has long been thought to be a North American exclusive phenomenon, there has recently been one confirmed instance of an affected ice machine in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Making it even stranger is the fact that the Dutch do not seem to have the same mass public perception of the prevalence of hotel ice machines that North Americans do. And it is still unclear if this was a single isolated event or a sign that the Keter-class anomaly is spreading to other locations. Only time will tell. But in the meantime, even if you're staying outside of North America and want a frosty drink, consider paying the outrageous fees and grabbing an already cold one from the minibar. If you don't, you might find that you're paying for your refreshing beverage with much more than a pound of flesh. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-150, the body-stealing parasite, for another anomaly that wants nothing more than to get inside of your body. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives. Dance failed! The young woman laughs as her date tries to catch his breath. The dancing rhythm game was much harder than he anticipated, and he can't help but also laugh at his abysmal score. He takes her hand and the two continue walking through the arcade. It's not crowded at all tonight, and the two have their choice of games as they bounce between the many pinball tables, driving games, and light gun shooters. As they finish up a game of air hockey, her date notices something. It's a door in the back of the arcade that's slightly ajar, the latch and a lock that should be keeping it closed hanging open. I wonder what's in there, he asks. Broken games? Maybe ones that let you play without putting in a token? Or keep spitting out tickets even when you lose? Come on! The two slip through the cracked door and find themselves in a dark room that doesn't look like anyone has been inside in a while. There's cobwebs and dust everywhere, but her date was right. It really is filled with broken games. He motions for her to follow as he checks out an old pinball machine. He presses the buttons, but it remains dark. He gives it a hard slap and… nothing happens. How disappointing. They really are just busted old machines. The two turn to leave. They might get kicked out if anyone finds them messing around in here. They're back at the door when they both stop and look at each other. Did they hear something behind them? The young woman shrieks with fear at the sight of the old woman staring at her. This time, it's her date's turn to laugh at her. It's just an old fortune teller, nothing to be scared of. They must have accidentally turned it on. She didn't notice it before, but the machine which has the words Grandmother Predictions written across the top has come to life, and the inside is now lit up to reveal the animatronic head and torso of an old woman. The old woman isn't moving, but her glassy dead eyes seem like they are staring right at the young woman. The two look at each other, unsure of what to do, when, without warning, the old woman comes to life. With the clicking and whirring of gears, the old woman appears to breathe in deeply, opening and closing her mouth as she leans slightly forward and back inside her glass container. The young woman steps towards the fortune teller as the old woman inside keeps breathing in and out. But then suddenly, the old woman stops. 
there's another loud click as a card appears out of a small slot on the front of the machine. She looks down at the card, then looks back up to see that the old woman is staring at her once again, as if the robotic figure can really, truly see her. The young woman slowly reaches towards the card as the old woman's gaze stays locked on her. Her fingers touch the card, and at the exact moment she pulls it free, the fortune teller's lights go out, and the old woman slumps over. What was that? Her date asks. She didn't even notice that he is standing next to her now. He starts to search around the machine looking for something that may have triggered it as the young woman looks down at the card she pulled from the slot. Her face changes as she reads it as she goes from a little freaked out to completely terrified. Hey, look at this, her date says as she quickly slips the card into her pocket. Her date reaches behind the back of the machine and pulls out a short piece of cord, one end attached to the fortune teller, the other frayed as if it had been cut. It's not even plugged in. Let's get out of here, she tells him. She doesn't need to ask him twice, and the two leave the room, emerging back into the lights and sounds of the arcade. Later that night, the two are at the door to the young woman's apartment. He asks if she's sure she's okay. She's not still scared about that broken machine, is she? It's probably just battery-operated and they switched it on somehow. The young woman agrees that must be it, and that she's fine, just tired. She gives him a kiss on the cheek and bids him goodnight before going into her apartment and closing the door. Inside, the young woman leans against the door. She takes something out of her pocket and stares at it. It's the fortune that was dispensed from the machine. It reads, You look like you've made some mistakes. Some things are unforgivable, aren't they? No way, she thinks to herself. It's just a coincidence. The young woman walks further into her apartment and picks up a framed photo. It's a picture of her several years younger, with another girl who looks just like her. Her sister. She thinks back to that night. The night that she'll never forget no matter how hard she tries. The night she lost her, and lost part of herself too. She sets the picture back down on the table before looking at the fortune she's still holding in her other hand. She crumples the paper in her fist and drops it in the trash before heading to bed. It's late at night and the young woman is tossing and turning with bad dreams when she suddenly pops up awake. Did she hear a sound? She looks around her dim room, but nothing looks amiss. There it is again though, a noise. Is it coming from the closet? She gets up out of bed and walks towards the closet, one slow step after another. She reaches towards the closet door, but the moment her fingers touch the knob, the door bursts open. She screams and falls backwards as multiple arms reach out of the darkness in the closet towards her. She screams and kicks at the arms as they grab at her, trying to pull her inside. She fights with all her might as she tries to crawl away from the arms. She manages to escape their grasp and stands up. She runs out of the room and towards the front door as the arms follow, reaching out of the closet, growing longer and longer, the sickening sound of bones twisting and snapping as they form new joints to bend around corners. Her hands reach out for the knob and she grabs it, just as the arms grab onto her. She's jerked backwards and falls to the floor as the arms drag her down the hallway. She tries to resist, her fingernails digging into the floorboards as the arms pull her back into the bedroom. Hello? You awake? The woman knocks loudly on the front door. Come on, we have reservations, you have to get up. The woman knocks again, but still no response. She checks her watch and with a sigh, takes out a set of keys. She finds the one she's looking for and unlocks the door. Everyone is waiting for us and I'm gonna tell them we're late because of... The woman gasps as she opens the door. She can't believe what she's seeing. The apartment is a mess. It looks like a bomb went off. She looks around, but there's no sign of her daughter. Then she notices the bloody claw marks leading down the hallway towards the bedroom. She runs down the hall, stops in the doorway to the bedroom, and screams. If you've ever been to an arcade, a midway, or a boardwalk, then you may have encountered a fortune-telling machine. These small booths containing an automaton are great fun as you receive a random card that purports to tell you your future or reveal a secret truth about yourself. There's nothing to it, obviously. It's just a random card you're getting, after all. But the SCP Foundation has a fortune-telling machine in its possession that's both very real and very dangerous. SCP-517, as it is known to the Foundation, is a two-meter-tall glass and wooden fortune-telling machine that contains a mechanical animatronic facsimile of an elderly woman wearing a white blouse and a blue shawl. On top of the machine is a panel with the words, Grandmother Predictions, written on it. Once per hour, the machine will power on if an individual enters what could be considered the elderly woman's field of vision. She will turn to directly face the person, seeming to stare right at them, before dispensing a fortune card from a slot on the front of the machine, after which it will appear to shut down and cease to function. 
It is unknown just how the machine becomes active, seeing as the only cord coming out of the back of the machine appears to have been severed. The fortunes dispensed when the machine comes to life are less a prediction and more of a veiled threat, and examples of ones received have included, your mother raised you better than that, I'm sorry, but fair is fair. Some people don't know how to be kind, you'll know soon enough, won't you? And people who do terrible things deserve terrible things. You've brought this upon yourself, my dear. Following an activation of SCP-517, starting at 1.43 a.m. local time, the same events will always occur. The individual that was targeted by the machine will find themselves attacked by a number of entities which have been designated as SCP-517-01. These entities are long, multi-jointed arms that emanate from a location nearby the individual. The exact number that appears will vary, but there usually seems to be between 10 and 36. The arms will appear from a single location that's often a low, cramped, and dark space like a closet, basement, or under a bed. The arms will reach out from this area and try to grab the individual before dragging them back to the location where they manifested. They appear to be able to stretch indefinitely, growing as long as they need in order to continue pursuing the individual, and their many joints allow them to bend around corners or any other obstacles. Should the individual manage to fight the arms off or escape, new arms will materialize nearby the victim to aid in the capture. Once the arms have subdued the targeted person and gotten them back to the area where they appeared, they will begin savagely assaulting them, beating and clawing at them, until nothing remains of the victim but a bloody pile of flesh and bones. To date, the Foundation is not aware of any targeted individuals surviving an attack by SCP-517-01 entities. In the event that the fortune-telling machine was activated multiple times on the same day, multiple instances of arms appearing will occur at different locations at the same time, with each group hunting their own individual target. Efforts have been made to figure out exactly where the arms manifest from, and during testing, cameras were set up around the targeted individual in order to try and locate a place of origin. Unfortunately, the arms somehow seemed aware that they were being watched, and the arms always emanated from around a corner or other place that was out of the field of view of the cameras. Tests on SCP-517 did reveal one piece of evidence, though, as fragments of DNA were recovered from the areas where SCP-517-01 instances appeared. DNA that turned out to be human in origin. The origins of the DNA and the identity of the owner have yet to be determined. Research and containment of SCP-517 has proven to be quite difficult, as evidenced by an event designated Incident 517-1997-M. As Foundation Agent Dr. Mail supervised the transport of SCP-517 to a new containment storage locker, the fortune teller suddenly activated and it was suspected that Dr. Mail had become a target. Security personnel were alerted, and a defensive strategy was devised to protect her from instances of SCP-517-01 that were expected to manifest that night at 1.43 a.m. Dr. Mail was taken to a helicopter on the roof of a Foundation cafeteria and given the protection of multiple security personnel as they waited for the arms to manifest. Right on cue, the arms appeared in a storage area inside the cafeteria and began stretching their way towards the roof. Security teams inside the cafeteria opened fire on the arms, which took damage just like normal human arms, so they would quickly be replaced by more. More instances of SCP-517-01 began appearing, coming out from under parked vehicles and other storage areas, as the number of arms coming out of the original manifestation site continued to increase, until there were over a hundred. The arms did not seem to want to fight back against the security teams, though. They seemed singular in their focus, to get to the roof where Dr. Mail was waiting. As the ever-increasing amount of limbs overwhelmed the security teams and breached the roof, the order was given for the helicopter to take off. The helicopter rose into the air, but the arms began manifesting from somewhere underneath the helicopter itself. The arms broke through the windows and pulled Dr. Mail out, passing her down to the waiting arms on the roof that then carried her through the cafeteria's ventilation system. A security personnel in the cafeteria attempted to sever the limbs with a knife and rescue Dr. Mail, but the arms are no longer ignoring their attackers and grabbed him as well dragging him down towards the storage locker along with the doctor. In the end, four members of the security team along with Dr. Mail were pulled into the storage area by the arms. Their remains were collected the next morning, and the Foundation made their best efforts to separate and identify what was left for individual funerary services. SCP-517, which has been classified as safe, is kept in a dedicated containment cell at all times, facing away from the doorway, with an opaque black sheet bound around it. Following the events of Incident 517-1997-M, all testing has been halted, without the express written permission of the site director. 
Peering into our future can be a fun activity, even when we know it's all just a bit of make-believe. When you pull your fortune from a booth containing an elderly automaton, though, you might just find that this time, Grammy knows your fate for real. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-3998, The Wicker Witch Lives, for another anomaly that's much more than first meets the eye. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives. The young couple held hands as they walked through the forest, the only light coming from the full moon which streamed down between the branches. The young woman is riveted by her friend's story. She's never been a fan of ghost stories, she scares too easily, but her friends insisted. But what they didn't know was that there was something else out there in the forest, something watching them. The young woman can't help but look around, scanning the forest to see if there's anything out there watching her. But it's too dark to see anything past the dim ring of light cast by the campfire. Just then, something emerged from the forest. The couple had no idea that it was just feet behind them, matching them step for step. Slowly, it began to reach out towards them. What was it? The young woman instinctually asked. It was... The Gashadokuro! The young woman screams in fear as she is grabbed from behind by a skeleton. But of course, the laughing of her friends clues her in immediately that this is not a real Gashadokuro. It's just her stupid friend in a mask. No one can contain their laughter. Even the young woman has to laugh a little. As her friend takes off his cheap skull mask, she playfully hits him in the arm. You jerk! You should have seen the look on your… The gigantic shrieking skeleton leaps from the woods and picks up the young man, shoving him straight into his mouth and consuming him, the boy crying out as his bones are snapped between its enormous jaws. Everyone screams and turns to run, but another colossal skeleton emerges from the forest, picking up two of the group, one in each hand, before smashing them together over and over, leaving nothing but a tenderized pile of flesh between its bony fingers that it then begins to devour. The young woman doesn't know what to do. She's petrified with fear, unable to move or even think. She's grabbed from behind and turns to see her friend who is telling the story. Come on, we have to go! She still doesn't move. She can't tear herself away from watching the horror that's playing out in front of her. But he grabs her hand and forcefully pulls her into the forest behind him. As they run through the woods, they can hear the sounds of their friends being eaten by the enormous skeletons. There's nothing they can do to help them, though. All they can do is run. The two sprint as fast as they can through the thick, dark forest, jumping over fallen trees, hoping that there's solid ground on the other side. The young woman's foot catches in a root, and she falls hard to the ground. Her friend stops and quickly comes back. As he is helping her stand up out of the mud, they both notice something. A sound. The heavy thuds of another giant skeleton. And it's getting closer to them. Come on, we have to keep going! With a loud shriek, a huge bony hand emerges from the forest and grabs the young man. The young woman watches as he is lifted a hundred feet into the air and stuffed whole into the gargantuan skeleton's mouth. She steps slowly backwards, knowing that she will soon meet the same fate, until the earth disappears beneath her feet. She tumbles down the hillside, somersaulting end over end, crashing through the brush on the hillside until dropping over an embankment. If the fall down the hill knocked her out, then the drop over the embankment was enough to wake her back up. Her wits come back just enough for her to roll under the embankment's ledge, and not a moment too soon. She huddles under the ledge and watches as the two skeletons stride over her hiding place and continue on deeper into the forest. She listens until the sounds of their thudding steps disappear. She doesn't know what to do. Should she try to get back to the campsite and see if any of her friends are still alive? If they are, they might need her help. But what if there are more of these… things out there? What if they come back, looking for her? Her mind races, unsure of what to do, and she has trouble thinking clearly. Her ears are ringing from her tumble down the hillside and her teeth audibly chatter in fear. As she debates her next move, trying to make sense of the nightmare she's found herself in, she suddenly notices something. A shadow cast by the moonlight begins to grow on the ground in front of her. That's when she realizes something else. It's not her teeth that are chattering. The sound is coming from somewhere else. She stands up and turns around to see a huge skull slowly rising up behind her. The giant skeleton, this one even bigger than the others, reaches out towards her. The girl closes her eyes, preparing to meet her fate as the skeleton starts to shriek. But it's a different kind of sound. She opens her eyes and is almost blinded by the intense white light on the skeleton's face. It sounds like it is shrieking in pain from the light being cast on it, and she's forced to turn away and shield her eyes. As she does so, she sees the source of light. It's a man in a uniform, 
He looks like some sort of tactical police officer, but instead of a gun, he's holding an enormous flashlight that he's pointing at the skeleton. More men who are dressed just the same emerge from the woods, blasting the skeleton with more light. It continues shrieking but seems helpless to do anything. She watches as the skeleton seems to lose its form, slowly disintegrating in the light, until eventually it disappears completely. Later, the young woman is sitting in the back of a van with a blanket wrapped around her shoulders. One of the policemen, at least she thinks he must be a policeman, brings her a hot drink. She still can't believe what she saw that night. The monstrous creatures that killed and ate her friends, it felt like it wasn't real, like she was watching a movie play out. Were those... were those... Gashodokuro? She asks. A man in a white lab coat looks up from a nearby table where he had been working on something. She thinks he must be a doctor of some kind. Yes, he tells her, or something similar to them. Maybe they inspired the myth of the Gashodokuro? Maybe the myth inspired them. We simply don't know. She asks. All my friends are... Dead, he interjects. I know this is hard for you. Getting chased by giant anomalous skeletons and watching your friends eaten alive would be tough for anyone to deal with. The young woman starts to sob, the weight of the moment finally hitting her. But I have some good news, he tells her. She sniffs and looks up at the doctor. Believe it or not, I've seen this thing happen a lot. And you don't have to worry, because you're not going to remember any of this. Ouch! The young woman cries, and looks down to see that he has jabbed her in the thigh with a syringe. She tries to push him away, but she's already feeling weak and disoriented. She sways a little before her eyes shut, and she passes out. The young woman wakes in the cheery morning light of her own bedroom. She yawns and stretches, the strange dream about skeletons in the forest already drifting from her mind. Konnichiwa, I'm Dr. Bob, and today's file is a terrifying anomalous entity referred to in Japan as the Gashodokuro, but known by the SCP Foundation as SCP-2863, the Starving Skeletons. SCP-2863 is not just one, but an entire population of entities that resemble gigantic human skeletons. These enormous bony creatures' size can vary, but on average they are approximately 30 meters tall. While their exact number is unknown, over 200 separate individual instances have been identified and catalogued, with each having distinctive markings, such as their bones having different types of damage or burn marks present. SCP-2863 instances are currently found exclusively in Japan, where they will appear only after sunset. It is still unknown if the skeletons are sapient, though they do appear sentient as they engage in their primary behavior of hunting down and consuming humans. Despite their enormous size, they are capable of moving very quietly when they want to, though there have been reports from survivors of their appearance being preceded by a rattling-like sound, which may be their own teeth or giant bones hitting against each other. Once they have caught a human, they will immediately devour them, with the human's blood appearing to be absorbed directly into their bones, since they lack any digestive organs. It is unknown if they require the blood of humans for sustenance, or if their predatory behavior is motivated by something else. Monitoring and control of SCP-2863 instances was previously the responsibility of the Imperial Japanese Anomalous Matters Examination Agency. The IJAMEA, which as the name suggests, was Imperial Japan's answer to the SCP Foundation, tasked with investigating the strange anomalies within their own borders for the benefit of the Empire. Several of the IJAMEA agents who had been investigating the Gashodokuro at the end of World War II transferred to the SCP Foundation when the Anomalous Matters Examination Agency was disbanded and continued their work on the anomaly. They also provided their original files on the anomaly, which gave the Foundation their first information on the giant anomalous skeletons. According to the IJAMEA's translated file, Gashodokuro are created by mass death by the concentrated suffering of hundreds. While the Gashodokuro will eventually fade, they remain for centuries after their creation, lingering until their sorrow has diffused and faded. There is no way to hasten this process. The IJAMEA file also explained that while conventional weaponry is useless against the anomalous skeletons, light can be used to banish the creatures, and either natural daylight or man-made light will suffice. When exposed to light, the skeletons will start to lose their corporeal form until they fade away completely. This doesn't kill instances of SCP-2863 though, it only temporarily neutralizes them, and appearances of the same instance will often be reported the very next night. Just as the IJAMEA had noted in their file, the SCP Foundation also made the connection between SCP-2863 and locations of mass suffering. While Imperial Japan's Anomalous Investigation Unit identified 203 instances of SCP-2863, the Foundation has since become aware of three others, each of which were found at sites connected to death and destruction. 
The first new instance was found near Nanjing, China, the location of an especially brutal massacre during the Second World War that may have resulted in as many as 300,000 deaths. It's believed that the entity first appeared in this location in 1938, just after the massacre, while the city was still under the control of Imperial Japan. This has led some to speculate that the locations where Gashodokuro appear are inherently tied to the borders of Japan as a nation and have fluctuated with geopolitical changes. The second was discovered several kilometers from Fukuoka City in Japan, a city that saw heavy firebombing by Allied forces during the war. The third was identified in 2011 in the Tohoku region of Japan, which is where the Fukushima nuclear disaster occurred. Each of these new instances appeared to bear injuries consistent with someone who suffered through the nearby tragedies, with the first showing evidence of crushed bones, the second appearing to have suffered intense burning, and the third missing teeth, which is common in cases of extreme radiation poisoning. These specific injuries add further evidence of the connection the Gashadokuro may have to human misery. The impermanent nature of SCP-2863 and their ability to manifest even after being neutralized has made long-term containment of this anomaly all but impossible, and they have been classified as Keter. In the event that an instance is spotted, Mobile Task Force Omicron 3 is dispatched to the area, where they will attempt to neutralize the entity through the use of high-powered floodlights. Any civilians who are exposed to SCP-2863 and survive are given Class A amnestics so that they can hopefully move on with their lives and forget their horrifying encounter with the starving skeletons. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-966, Sleep Killer, for another anomaly who has decided to make humans its preferred prey. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.